Welcome to the BIP Ventures Extraordinary Pursuits Podcast, a fascinating and inspiring journey into the world of venture capital and startups. Each episode offers masterclasses and entrepreneurial stories from some of the top minds in the innovation economy. Get ready to unlock new ideas and gain valuable advice for how to thrive as an innovator and an investor. Today on Extraordinary Pursuits, Christy Johnson talks with Haley Devlin and Jason Moore, the co-founders of DNA Partners. Haley is an operations coach with more than 10 years in sales, marketing, and product leadership roles. Jason is a serial entrepreneur with two exits under his belt. Together, Haley and Jason lead DNA Partners, a coaching and advisory firm focused on helping startup and growth companies, particularly in the areas of go-to-market and operations. The company works to improve operating maturity across leadership, priority setting, communication, and core values. Let's get started. So I know that um, whenever people start thinking through the go-to-market, the default is always sales, and they start really start focusing on all the sort of functional things that they need to do, and no one really thinks sort of broadly, but you also don't hear people talking operationally what needs to be in, built out within the foundation of the company. And so um, one of those foundational builds would be the team. So do you guys have thoughts on sort of what those first, second, third hires look like? Yeah, definitely. When we're working with uh, companies and founders specifically, it's usually you know kind of assessing what their specific individual talent is or whoever else they have on the team. Uh, and then how do we kind of pull the things that are not their strength off of them quickest? So, you know, if they're a, a really high level or can close deals or really enjoy, you know, lead generation, then, you know, let's look at a CSM hire. Uh, let's look at onboarding and training, pulling those things off so they can better focus on, on their biggest strength. Yeah, I, w- I would add to that. I think a conversation we often have is uh, full time versus part time or outsourced. So talking a lot about people are you know often inclined to bring on a full-time BDR or a full-time content producer if you want to get leads, you know, via email marketing. And those are some examples, you know, BDR and content generation are great examples of talent you can get really easily and inexpensively in a part-time capacity. So I think that's part of the conversation as well. Yeah, one thing we've learned on that note from uh, a few of our clients is they have what would be seen as a BDR outreach program, but virtually no phone calling whatsoever. And when you have that, uh, we've learned that that, you know, as Haley mentioned, you know, a part-time capacity, not necessarily outsourcing. We haven't seen a lot of success with outsourcing BDR or, or lead generation, you know, as, as much as that's offered. Uh, but when you're doing LinkedIn and email outreach, uh, that being done on a part-time basis, you know, with as much distributed workforce as, as we have today, there are a lot of people that are looking to work, you know, two days a week. And if they're, you know, cranking eight hours for two days a week, that's probably quite a bit more than the founder can can focus on lead generation and LinkedIn messaging, which can really increase that, that output. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, too, is that looking at it through the lens of what's the best thing to take off the founder's back, which is the place that they have the, the least amount of experience. So, like you said, if it's a sales uh, oriented founder, then let's figure out how to make sure that the support function is is fully done and then not thinking through it exclusively. It has to be the full-time hire because clearly at this stage, the um, you're trying to be as prudent as you can with the dollars. And so it feels like a, a real commitment on the full-time and this might be a way to get some relief, but not have to make the, the full commitment to the salary. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. On that subject, I know that we've all seen it. We've probably potentially even done it um, where we've used the titling to sort of like in lieu of cash. And then you end up um, sort of paying the piper back on that. Have you guys seen that as well? Yes, um, we've we've made that one, uh, made that mistake a couple of times. And I think what you know, what there is a tendency to do is. Um, bring someone in either at a at a higher title than you need or even than they're qualified for. So you walk in thinking, well, this is my first true go-to-market person. I need them to build a team. Let's call them a CRO. Um, and then you find yourself in a pickle, you know, two years down the road when you need an actual CRO. And then that's a very difficult conversation to have. And it's it's difficult because this person has probably done great work for you. And if assuming they're happy and can continue to add value to the team, you want to keep them around, but not in a true CRO capacity. So I think that's one common mistake. And then we see a second one too, 
and I know you are. It's the kind of uh, over hiring. So the other, the, the flip side of that coin is uh, we need a go to market person. So let's go find somebody that has 25 years experience selling into our particular industry that's led, you know, teams of 20 and 30, and you have an entire team of four. And, you know, one job description we saw before we, we helped kind of re, um, redesign the job description and then, you know, kind of their team. Um, one of the bullet points I remember the recruiter had added was uh, illustrating being able to work cross departmentally really well. And this entire company had three people in it. So there was no <laughs> cross departmentally functionality and, and, you know, getting a focus on that. Uh, inside the job description. And I think that was like the second or third bullet point. So it was really high ranking. And you know, that was really kind of taking that and saying, you know, um, kind of almost educating the recruiter on, hey, we, we need somebody to sell in this particular capacity. As Haley mentioned, we don't need a CRO. We don't want to promote somebody that's not a, a CRO to CRO because that is a long-term pain. And then if you go and recruit somebody from a, from a big company, um, you know, they're going to be expensive. Uh, they're probably going to be frustrated. You're going to be frustrated because they don't want to actually pick up the shovel and dig the ditch that that needs to be dug. Um, they want to go hire 10 people and your budget was actually for one person. And you splurged on this person because you thought they were going to bring in all this, you know, all the leads and they had this Rolodex. Uh, so one's kind of a really costly, but many times short term because it just is obvious that it's not going to work out. Exactly, right. The overtitling which is the person that has been really doing well for you, then you make them the CRO or the CTO or whatever it may be. It's not necessarily as costly up front, but it could cause that real long-term pain, as Haley mentioned. You know. One thing I am uh, quite passionate about in recruiting at a, a you know startup growth company, and this isn't just limited to go-to-market hires, is experience at a small company. Uh, I think oftentimes people think they want to work at a startup, but they never have. And therefore, they don't understand what that really means. Yeah. Um, people will often say, oh, I, you know, I worked at a massive organization, but it was basically a startup within that company. And it's like no, I, there there is no substitute for understanding what the day to day reality is at a small organization unless you've been there. And I think you know that could potentially lead to unmet expectations or um, just misaligned expectations around what exactly is built and what is not built and what is ambiguous. And the answer is usually everything. Oh. Um, and so, you know, those early critical hires, I think early stage company experience is so important and there's really no substitute for it. And then also there's such a a, a balance that must be struck between finding the right uh, background and skills and then the right kind of EQ and soft skills is so important at this stage too, because you don't need someone who's, you know, has decades worth of experience doing the thing necessarily. You need someone who's got high energy, high enthusiasm and passion behind what you're doing and that you trust to be, you know, in the passenger seat riding shotgun with you, um, especially if this is your first, you know, big go to market hire and you're going to be doing a lot of work with that person. So we coach a lot of founders on that particular piece is like, take your time in this hiring process because it will be a costly and uh, painful mistake if you hire the wrong person. And this is not a true partner for you. It's a classic, classic issue, right? That the other thing that I find is that that you need a builder, but someone who loves building. It's like, you know, they're solving a puzzle and they don't mind rolling their sleeves up. And so the other thing about the um, over hiring is that, um, as Jason said, they don't want to do that. They want to, you know, orchestrate or they want to manage or they want to build strategy. And yeah, those things would be really important. But should we have that problem? That'll be great. Um, but yeah. right now, we don't have any sales decks and we don't have uh, any marketing material and we don't have any process. And so those things need to be built. And there is there's definitely the the uh the energy level that's necessary, but it's also the willingness that they actually enjoy this type of work. And I've actually had people who like, once it gets like easy, they're out, you know, like they like the build. So right. it's like you said, taking your time to find that person. The other thing is um, everyone that comes from a big company that, but it was like basically a startup on the inside. Um, they don't have financial 
like the, they've never had to worry about how we're going to pay payroll. Mm -hmm. They've never had to make a decision like, do we take this customer on, even though I know they're not completely target so that we can pay everybody in two weeks. So that is a very different type of threshold. And it's also a very uh, different type of way of viewing things when you know if something doesn't work that you just go on to the next thing and then there's no repercussions for bad decisioning. You don't hone those those decision making skills quite in the same way. So it is definitely an essential hire. Um, like just said, the one good thing is that it does tend to um, show itself relatively quickly. You don't get, you know, uh, two years down the line and say, you know, this isn't really the right person, but um, it definitely is um, stage specific and it's the difference of make and break, I think, of, of getting the thing off the ground in terms of the go to market. Mm -hmm. it's just That's right. Great. So when you guys are thinking through like the hot, the sales hire specifically, um, and let's take it maybe from two different vantage points. One is that you have a, um, a sales oriented founder. So it's all founder led sales versus somebody who may be more of a technical founder who has a great product, but as there's the sales function and motions are nascent, what do you guys suggest in terms of like what that that first hire looks like in terms of uh, sort of background and maybe even title? Uh, so if you're, if, I think you asked about like if it's a more technical founder that doesn't have the sales skills and I'll kind of wrap this because the inverse is also true with a sales focused founder when I was starting my company. I needed you know, to do the same thing on the technical side for myself. And, and really what it is, is you have to find somebody, I think that like Haley mentioned this earlier, just that trust uh, and compatibility is probably first and foremost, uh, even maybe before the skill, because you know the skill can come, but if the skill's there and there's no trust and compatibility, it's just not gonna, not gonna work out. So you, can, you, you may be able to hire a little downward uh, or partner a little downward, you know, in skill wise, as long as the compatibility and trust is there, because then you can go and, you know, backfill maybe with a fractional CTO or partner with, you know, with a firm that, that does that kind of thing. So you're off on the right, you know, foot. Uh, but once again, you know, in the trenches, that trust and compatibility was, was it, you know, it's, it's paramount. You know, I, I had that my partner, Brian Daly with, with, you know, with Stratasan because, you know, Quite honestly, I'm not technically proficient at, at all, um, and I, you know, I got very lucky that Brian was as high caliber as he was. But I think, you know, we had a great 12 year partnership because of that compat compatibility and trust, and you know, we trusted each other to do our thing and and continue to build a team together. Um, so as a technical co-founder, you know, once again, small company experience, trust compatibility, and then we'll kind of figure it out from there, right? You know, if, if we're working alongside each other. On the, the sales piece, say that it is, say, founder-led sales, and now they're doing, but they are essentially responsible for everything that's happening. So you're trying to, like, help them think through that first tire. Do they get a um, an AE in there that they basically instruct? Do they get a sales director that can start to build some bones? Like, what is the first tire you think look like? Uh, I would probably say it's not a closer. So it's it's probably not an account executive because the founder is probably going to be unmatched uh, when it comes to that particular piece. So once again, pulling the things off that should be pulled off first. Uh, so you, pr I, I would probably kind of go back towards as, as far up the funnel as I could. So how, you know, how can we get top of funnel solved maybe first um, or uh, potentially a sales engineer, you know, that can kind of play a couple of different roles. Uh, I mean, quite honestly, I think any, hire that you make here is going to be a little bit of a utility knife. So yeah. they need a couple of different, you know, skill sets. Uh, but, you know, really, if th they are, a, you know, founder led sales, the immediate thing is certainly not to get them off the closing circuit. Um, I guess the second thing is, is uh, what they most like doing, right? Do they prefer, you know, um, you know, assisting someone else? Uh, because if you know if that's the case, you could get an AE that that understands how to how to mechanically move a deal through a pipeline, uh, and with that founder's assistance, you know you can really hyperdrive, you know your your sales process. Because uh, once again, getting back to my flaws, I wasn't good at at uh, the rigor that a sales professional has, but I was really happy to be their kind of subservient, 
you know, sales engineer or whatever, you know, drop in whenever they needed me if, as long as they were keeping it on track. But, no, I, I, uh, I think your utility knife is, I mean, that's the perfect way to describe it. Cause at this stage, uh, no matter what the title of the person is or the background of the person is, they're going to end up, you know, breaking that scope on day two. Um, but I think you might even be designing the next one pager. Exactly. Cause, who knows, right? Cause, Cause we don't actually have a marketing now. department. So we're right. going <laughs> to the toilet um, in the bathroom. If like I hand you a plumber. All right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Um, but I think specifically for a technical founder, and this is fresh on the brain because a client of ours is in this particular situation, the very technical founder and, and existing team is, you know, skews technical as well. And so their first go to market hire who ended up being a closer uh, was also the first true business hire that they made. And so it, it transcended just the selling. And it was important to find someone who really liked the building and understood the functions of the business beyond sales because, you know, they were the first person bringing that skill set to the team. Yeah, Christy, you mentioned that earlier, right? The, the enjoying of the build, because, you know, half jokingly, I, I said about the marketing, but guess what? You're probably the the lead marketing person as well, or at least working yeah. with a third party that's designing it. And um, that that person that we helped that that company add, you know, they everything in their interview process talked about. I really enjoy the build process, and I think that <clears throat> that um, comfort with am, with ambiguity that yeah. entrepreneurs have to have. Those early hires, you know, they may not have been the founder, but they are they they need to be entrepreneurial, and yeah. they need to understand ambiguity is the rule. Like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. I always say they got to be comfortable in gray because there's no black and white. Like you never know the answer. You never have enough data and you're always sort of swimming in gray and you have to feel perfectly comfortable doing that or it'll eat you alive. That's mm -hmm. correct. So actually like, talking about um, building, you know, your one pager, or you're having to sort of build the content as you go. That's actually an area that I think um, also as you're thinking, like, how do you operationalize and start to build out the the core things that the um, the go to market needs that can feel very overwhelming because they're like, oh, my goodness, I have to build, you know, what do I do for my um, marketing stack and what do I use for SEO words and what do I use for content? And oh, my goodness, I have to build 3000 pieces of collateral. And I went out on the Internet and I found out all these things and it's just like my head's about to explode. I'm sure you have questions on like what first and then what order and like how do I make take these what appears to be 2000 things I need to do and sort of boil it down to the essence of the foundation. So uh, I will disclaim this by saying, you know, we are by no means uh, professional content people. But when it comes to getting started with a foundation um, where we typically guide younger companies is first and foremost, simplify, right? You don't need 10,000 things like you just said. Um, and where we encourage people to start is we've labeled it a content bank, which, you know, as the name suggests is let, let's call it a Google doc, put all of the fundamental core language about your business, the about section of your company, your key products, what their value propositions are, your key customers, your mission, vision, values, like just the very fundamentals of your organization Get that, spend time getting every single word on that page or several pages correct that everybody in the organization buys into, feels comfortable with. And once that's done, that becomes kind of this, the, the jumping off point for every single piece of content you have. That, then you can build a sales deck. You go right back to that, uh, you know, holy grail of content to build your one pagers. Um, and then anytime a change needs to be made, you make it in that one central spot um, so that you keep everything on track from there on out. Yeah. It's, it, it, when you build your content bank out, like, like Haley said, and, you know, I, I love the fact that she mentioned, you know, a Google doc, cause it doesn't have to be sophisticated. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are tools that you can pay for, but also you can just use free things. Um, but that content bank and then plus like a, a, you know, maybe a professional style guide or brand guide that you paid for. You know, you want to talk about, once again, like really elevating the ability to use a third party designer. Right. So if you if you need somebody to come in and, and add some sales messaging, they have this content bank that they can get a really crisp idea of what you're trying to communicate. You know, give the style guide and the content bank to a designer or a design firm and you can spend a lot less money. It's it's just like, you know, Chrissy, when, when you're talking about product. Right. Like if you get 
really good product guidelines going, whether it be wireframe, you know, and really understanding full stack. If you, if you engage with a, a development shop prior to that, you're going to spend a lot of money spinning your wheels trying to figure those things out. If you get really good at product management and product early design, that makes everything more efficient down the road. And I think that's you know where, where Haley's talking about having a content bank and having that brand or style guide together. Those are really two components that can, you know, whether, whether or not you're ready to hire that first marketing person, that third party is going to be more powerful. And then you continue to grow until, until you're ready for that FTE. And I think the uh, fail fast, uh, ship early philosophy applies here too. Like we've made this mistake as well, where you spend 10 gazillion hours trying to perfect your Canva sales one sheeter or, you know, try to build out a really full fledged 50 page sales deck. And at the end of the day, when you get it in front of a real live prospect, you're going to learn that this language doesn't really resonate or that this value proposition, actually, we need to scrap it and start over. So starting lean um, and making sure you get that message right is so important before you start to blow up volume wise and quantity of things. Yeah. You're barely going to forget something, right? You're going to spell your, you can spend three weeks building a one pager and, and then in sentence two, you've misspelled the name of your company, right? <laughs> like get it in front of people fast so you can correct it fast. Yeah. And I think that also sort of is a little bit liberating for people too, is to just look at it. This is a build and this is a process. And so, you know, we're not after perfection. We're not, you know, trying to wordsmith this thing to death. We're just trying to put down the essence of what it is that we, you know, we know is valuable, you know, that meets the pain of the people that we're trying to, to talk to and then see how it resonates and, you know, and continue to iterate. But I mean, that's really like what you do the entire time, but just looking at your sort of go to market in that way, like let's put all the foundational things in place and then learn. And, you know, I always make fun that like, because it feels so true is that a week in startup land is like, you know, a quarter everywhere else, you know, because it's so much happens. You're like, oh, let's look back at what we did this week what <laughs> you know nobody else believes you you know you're like you did what this week no right. this literally is what we did um and so i think that just giving yourself a little bit of grace and saying like you know we don't have to have all this built out we don't have to have 300 pieces of content and you know it, let's just every single week or every single month we're going to add a piece of content and then you know in one year we're going to have 12 nice pieces and yeah. you know just look at it in incremental victories as opposed to like and because the other thing that happens is just, you know, paralysis by analysis and that you think there's so much that has to be done, nowhere to start, you know, just like anything else, put one foot in front of the other and we'll, we'll have something. It might not be the right thing, but, um, you know. And like, I think not, not being af uh, ashamed or afraid to evolve. He gets mad at me when I say pivot. Uh, but, but, but we you, don't pivot, we evolve. <laughs> you <laughs> will evolve. And, and, you know, the offering evolves, the messaging evolves, the packaging evolves. And I think that's something I struggled with was, gosh, do, I mean, how, how much do we not have our act together if we're changing things every other week? only to learn that that's kind of part of the process. Yeah, exactly. You change it less and less over time, right? As you evolve, you should be stronger and bigger, better, faster. I, if, if you don't mind, I'll go back to the hiring too. When you talked about like what, what hire you're, you're going to do first, we were working with a client earlier this week uh, uh, on the kind of top of funnel hiring. And they were budgeting and kind of concerned about spending money on an FTE on that. And they had kind of, you know, earmarked 80 grand for a salary to start out with. And that's where we kind of dialed back and say, look, what, you know, if you, if you make smaller bets, right. And then you, you, then you make them more often and definitely make them sooner, right. If you're, if you're delaying because it might be too much money and you might make a wrong decision, we'll make a smaller bet. So we talked about, you know, kind of what we mentioned earlier, which is, you know, look for somebody that's that's looking for a two day a week gig that you can pay, I don't know, twenty five, thirty dollars an hour plus a bonus when they you know book a book a demo through your process, and you're going to iterate you know really really quickly. You're going to iterate your messaging. You're going to iterate you know how you follow up and how you structure things, and the stronger and stronger you get, then you're really ready for that first FTE hire on on any given you know any given skill set. And I think this gets back to the content make like you know make small bets. Make them fast, make them soon, and then be really, really ready to, to iterate on it. Yeah, and the the 
the example that you're using in terms of making the smaller bed, I think that that could be applied to almost anything, right? Like that we're trying to build and that um, doesn't feel so scary in terms of the making the mistake as well as, you know, the, the money associated with that particular thing, because, yeah. you know, we're all trying to be as frugal as you can and you're not going to um, really double down until you got it. And it's never going to feel in the beginning like you got it because you likely right. don't yet. So, um, you know, just I like that, giving yourself sort of permission to like make a smaller bet, uh, which uh, it gets you off dead center. Because that also happens so often is that they won't make a decision because it feels like there's, you know, there's so much gravity to the to the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what, one thing we did uh, in our last company is, and I, this could be kind of wordsmithing a little bit, but I, it worked in the sense that we kind of framed everything as an experiment, right? And if everything's an experiment, there's really no mistakes, right? There are there are kind of, oh, we now learn that this is not the correct path, but now we experiment again. And it's it was amazing how many how many people felt that was more freeing and really took more risks and really were able, you know, to to kind of confidently make a smaller bet sooner. Because in the end, it was an experiment. And if it failed, then we knew not to do that anymore. And if it worked, then let's do it more. And so we continually built upon that. And it was really just framing every, I mean, literally everything as an experiment. Even right? when like, we were 60, 70, 80 people, yeah, we had yeah. people doing that. No, hundred percent. Like, we got better and better at it, <laughs> that, you know, the, the bigger we got really, which is strange. Yeah, probably got very much ingrained in the culture. Like that, right. you know, we're just like, we're we're thoughtful risk takers and there we make small bets and we learn fast and pivot yeah. often. I mean, we don't want anybody blowing up the whole lab, but <laughs> you know, if they, if they break a beaker, who cares, right? Like, <laughs> you know, we need another beaker. So that's actually an interesting thought. Like, on um, yeah, what do you guys advise when people are like first getting started? There's certainly that cultural aspect, right? That we want to be intentional. We want to be purposeful, but it can't feel heavy either. Um, you know, this isn't a, a massive, like, five day offsite where we're coming up and fine tuning every word of our vision. And so um, I would imagine directionally you guys like talk through that with, you know, and with uh, new companies and founders thinking about what they want their company to be when they get to a certain size and that you're trying to pull some of that intentionality back um, from the very beginning. And I think that that also probably influences those hires as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... You just spurred a new thought. So forgive me if this needs to be edited <laughs> out. But uh, but like one of the things that I love about what you were just saying, and it reminded me of, you know, 13 years ago when we were starting our, you know, the, our last company, this is going to be one of the issues that, that an entre the entrepreneurs today are going to have to solve for faster. Because when we were starting our company, we were actually in the office together and we were eating lunch together every day. So we were absorbing all the, we, we didn't need a five day offsite because we were together all the time. And, you know, I, I love the hybrid environment. I'm, I'm a big fan, but that's something that an entrepreneur and the, and the early, you know, founding or early members are going to have to really focus on is getting better at that communication and better at that information gathering in a distributed manner faster than we had to. Now, you know, we, we went through COVID and we had to go distributed at that point and we figured it out later but right yeah. now when you're kicking off a company you have to do that immediately right like you know we had we had to get good at it but you have to start good at it today yeah and you have to be super intentional about it because if you think about all the ways that you like learning just happens through osmosis when you're around other people and you're hearing things that you're not you know you don't even recognize that you're intentionally getting anything out of and so what i found when we went remote because it was the same team that was smooth, right? Like you already have trust established, you already have relationships, everybody knows how to work with one another. Um, you give, you know, you know the personalities. So if, you know, something doesn't go right or they say something in a way like, oh, of course, you know, you like it's just so and so. Then when we started growing and having to actually add people to the team, that's where it got like, how do you instill your culture and how do you make sure that they feel that in a way? Because nothing really substitutes for like being together. Right. So just trying to you know, figure out ways to engage. But also um, like it was so easy just to walk around and say, hey, what are you working on? Or to see people 
people's um, mannerisms or like they seem to be off that day. It was really easy mm-hmm. to say, hey, you're doing all right. You know, you seem a little off and you just don't have that same transparency when you're working, you know, through Zoom and especially with people that you've never been, you've never had the luxury of developing sort of the 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 roots of all the relationships with. So I, I will tell you that it was very shocking to me. We had our symposium, so we had, you know, leadership uh speaker come in and he was he said how many people are working you know 100 percent remote so maybe half the room put up their hands and then how many i you know are hybrid the other half we don't have one company that's all uh, on site right now and i did not and i i did not recognize that so this idea and of course then that led to a really sort of nice conversation related to like what people are using and what people are doing and it's not anything like earth shattering, right? Like, oh, it's like I do a Friday note and I make sure that everybody in the company knows what the other functional areas are doing. We have a monthly all hands where we go through and you know we have a different people present from the different functional teams. And then once a quarter we do, we bring everybody into town and we do social things. And you know, so it's not like, oh my goodness, I would have never thought of that. But there is some intentionality out of it that is super important because you have to make effort in ways as like uh, your C-level staff and the CEO in ways they've never like probably are not part of their core functional like uh, work process, you know, like one, I you, one, one thing we added there, you want to talk about donuts and how that it, it's not a perfect solve. It's nothing that this is going to be earth shattering, but it really completed yeah. the water cooler thing. What he's talking about is uh, what we call organizational habits because, you know, everybody talks about your core values. And at this point, core values are and should be table stakes for the organization. But the the harder part, in my opinion, is, okay, core value is sort of the, uh, the ideal state of the organization, the behaviors that we want to see. But how do we actually bake into the fabric of our company these ideals or these values? Um, and so we got really... Uh, kind of crystallized organizational habits. So things that you can literally see on the calendar, like the all hands um, that contributes to those core values or that illustrates those core values. And one of the things we rolled out um, when we transitioned to fully remote is a super simple uh, Slack plugin called Donuts. They have plugins for um, other types of chats as well. But all it does is pairs two employees together at random uh, once every two weeks, and you meet for 30 minutes. It kind of facilitates the setting up of the meeting. You meet for 30 minutes, and there's only one rule. You are not allowed to talk about work. <laughs> and then it does another cool thing where it kind of uh, prompts you to take a selfie during the Zoom meeting and summarize what y'all chatted about. And that, it gives me chills just telling that overview because that created more gel and community and um, rela- like sparked all these relationships from the development team to the sales team to the you know, people that don't normally work together every single day. And they get to know each other as human beings. And quite honestly, we say it, re- you know, replaced water cooler chat. I think it blows water cooler chat out of the water because at water cooler chat, it's about the weather and maybe the sports yeah, update from the last weekend. weekend. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, I mean, 30 minutes is a, a good amount of time to just one-on-one chat with someone about, anything unrelated to work. It was truly profound. And if you're a, a, an entrepreneur or a senior leader of a company and you're like, ah, eh, I don't have time for that. Trust me, every single time I saw a donut thrown on my calendar, I roll my eyes, I take a deep breath, I don't have time <laughs> for this. This is silly use, you know, what up? And every single time, you know, I, I always attended and I always showed up for it. And at the end of that 30 minutes, it was the best 30 minutes I spent that week, every single time. Now, I will say as a CEO, as, as the CEO at the time, it was hard for people not to talk about work. It was like, oh, I have the CEO. So I'm going to, right, but right. I was really, really encouraged like, yeah, okay, we can talk. And I, you have to let a little room for that. But then again, it's like, oh, okay, so what, did, but, but what did you do this weekend? Like what, like, and don't right. tell me you worked all weekend. I, it's not, it's not going to, I don't want you working all weekend. So don't tell right, me you right. did, but like, but it, every single time. There would be a little hint of, man, I, I'm going to have to shut everything down and do this. And then when I did it, it was legitimately the best it's use of my time. Product. Yeah, I love that. So, Holly, was it? Did you say that was you guys did it on Slack? It's a Slack plugin. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's called Donuts on Slack. On Teams, it's 
called um coffee chat or something yeah coffee, coffee talk or something like that like there, there are plugins for all the all the various uh platforms yeah slack's actually a really powerful tool because the other thing that is you know do use it for shout outs and then have them then tie that to a core um core value and so when someone's demonstrating that then they can give a shout out and then it just sure. sort of keeps reiterating as you say, like codifying the behaviors that you want to see that actually support those core values. So I don't think we want to talk about our shout outs channel because Haley will probably start crying because <laughs> it was really a, a great place that our, our Slack channel just worked for shout outs. It was it was truly unbelievable. And I think what made it or what was so cool about it to me is that it wasn't leadership shouting out their teams all the time. It right. was yeah. organically you know, cross team, it was up and up to down, down to up, side to side. It was just this really organic, I mean, truly a habit that just, yeah. uh, we got Even the muscle. sometimes memory. the sales and engineering team were complimenting each other. <laughs> that's, it was the greatest thing ever. Of. Like, that, that's, yeah. that doesn't happen in real life. And it did. It was really happening in real life. It was really kind of creating bonds across, across the departments. Yeah, well, we had the exact same experience, I think, because you don't have any opportunity otherwise. Like you want to say thank you and you want to acknowledge like, my goodness, the engineer stayed up till 2 a.m. to get this this bug fixed for this client that has this big presentation at eight o'clock in the morning and needed it done. And they didn't say anything about it, you know, rather than have that happen in a vacuum. People just got in the habit that that was the way that you acknowledged, you know, and wanted to sort of give some kudos and attaboys and shout outs to your colleagues. And like you said, it went up, down and across and it was really great. So it's funny how a piece of technology that when it first came out was like the scourge of like the interruption of my day every 10 seconds. Yeah. Um, and then you like sort of learn how to leverage it. So anyway, I, this has been a great conversation and I guess I'll just close it. Do you guys have any questions for me? Uh, yes, we have many. Um, I'll start with, um, you know, I imagine as, as y'all have gotten this program uh, running and you've been able to see so many portfolio companies and, you know, therefore can kind of start to recognize patterns. I would love to hear what has been particularly surprising to you uh, as you look across the portfolio base um, around, you know, wh where either they need help or uh, are looking to you for guidance. Yeah, so great question. And I would say that this is probably no different than when I was in the shoes of an early stage company thinking that everybody else had it together. Like, I know these things that we're had, like, everybody else is so organized. And I saw the person's deck, and my goodness, that was amazing. Which, speaking of which, I was going to ask you guys earlier when we were talking about like how you evolve over time. Do you guys have you ever looked back on your old board decks, like oh. your original ones? <laughs> oh, I have, I, Chrissy. I have, I have a, I have a CD-ROM on my dresser of my in my bedroom at home. Okay, so that tells you how old this is already. <laughs> and Stratasian's first name was called, was Health Data Source. That was when we launched, and we changed it pretty early in, in early 2011. But there is a CD-ROM on my dresser, and it says Health Data Source First Pitch Entrepreneur Center. I won't watch it. I'm scared to watch it. Like I really, it yeah. would be. I, I don't think I could make it through it. And it's only like a three minute video because we had a like a hard stop or it was a short right. video. I don't think I could make it through it. I and yeah, there's no. I don't. Yeah. I'm scared of it. I have the same. So I look back in embarrassing moments. But to to get to the question, I think that. Um, it was a little surprising to me because, you know, you have a spectrum of, of different companies and some, you know, were startup showdowns winners and they have get $250,000 all the way to, you know, they have 50 million in ARR. There's just fundamental things that, you know, maybe they did it in the beginning, but they have to revisit like and then ask three of those questions. Who are we going after? What are we telling them when we find them? How do we find them? Like all of those things that you know, it, that we somewhat take for granted or we might be close, but we need to sort of get those things really as tight as we possibly can. So everybody sort of still has some development that they could do on that because what ends up happening is you get close and you just start blowing and going and you never, it feels like a luxury to sort of revisit it. And so, you know, a lot of money is spent um, sort of being close, but not, not close enough. And so, or being too broad and not mm -hmm. really honing in on what you're going after. And so it didn't, it doesn't really matter the size of company. That's sort of a chronic issue that, um, you know, People don't take the time, you know, the old cliche, slow down to, uh, to speed up. 
it really is true, but, you know, sort of giving them permission to like, hey, you don't have to run as fast and it's, you're not, you can get off of the, you know, the hamster wheel for, you know, a little bit of time to make sure that what we're trying to hit is the, is the right target. Um, and then, you know, just all kinds of the things we're talking about today, infrastructure, where, you know, it's kind of like when you make the MVP and everything is, you know, we're doing sort of prototyping. And if this works and customers like it, we'll come back and really build it out. And then, you know, 10 years later, six years yeah. later, you know, like duct tape and uh, everything's put together with bubble gum and, uh, you know, Band-Aids. But, uh, you know, it, it's just uh, the blocking and tackling and making sure that, you know, we, the foundation that we're all building on is strong enough because it'll come back and manifest itself in so many ways. As we all know, you know, we think we're solving a churn problem, but it's actually a targeting problem. Or we think we're, you know, we focus so much on bringing customers in, but we don't think about how we retain them and how we grow them because that feels like a luxury where that is essentially the, you know, the essence of what has to be done from the get go. And you know, we want every customer to stay and be delighted. And um, we don't give that near as much concern as we do on the sales piece. And then the incon like seeing that as a continuum, like the from the time that a customer make we make the first impression and at that point as a prospect to the time that customer then expands um, and how that informs product, seeing that as a cohesive process internally mm -hmm. and they're not these siloed things. Um, everybody kind of has some version of that and it's the rare company that kind of has that all understood and has that that and that you know that um, cohesiveness between the way they talk about their company in their marketing material all the way to the how they um, are intentional about the expansion and the product development and feature set. So I would say that um, the the fact that that exists at almost every level was a bit of a surprise. Yeah, but it kind of makes sense, right? Because it's if you get it right, but then you grow, then you have to revisit. You, you talk about slowdowns to speed up. Uh, our, our advisory firm for startup and growth, DNA Partners, actually that's the genesis of the name. So the Latin term fascinolente means, uh, it, it was a sailing term about the um, about kind of getting it right first, planning well, planning slowly, and then you can move fast. And the symbol of it was a dolphin and an anchor. So that's actually where the DNA comes from is dolphin and anchor. Uh -huh. uh, and then also around the organizational DNA. So we are big fans yeah. of slowing down to speed up. Well, uh, what a perfect apropos way to like, That's right. yeah, so um, thank you guys so much and appreciate all that you guys have done, like in helping us sort of calibrate what we do with our, um, you know, our portfolio companies and uh, always being great, like mind share and, you know, sharing things that you guys are seeing and that you're, um, you know, as you evolve and the offerings that you have and really appreciate all that you do to support us as BIP Ventures, as well as our portfolio companies. So thank you for awesome. your time and really appreciate it. Yeah. Great chatting, Christy. Great to yeah. see you. All right. Talk soon. All right. Thanks, Bye. Christy. Thanks for listening to the BIP Ventures Extraordinary Pursuits podcast. Check the show notes on our blog for the resources we discussed. You can find Extraordinary Pursuits on your favorite audio platform. Be sure to subscribe to the BIP Ventures YouTube channel and connect with us on LinkedIn, X, and Instagram so you get all the stories, learnings, and ideas for ways to thrive in the innovation economy. And if you liked this episode, be generous. Share it.